so good. <laughs> All right. Oh, let's get this turned on. I want to thank everyone again for the opportunity to be here uh, this weekend. And thank you for being here, uh, for setting aside time on the Lord's Day to assemble with a church family and to remember Jesus and to hopefully grow and mature as a disciple. I mean, really on Sunday mornings, it's God's people coming together, trying to become more like Jesus. And we want to thank you for making time to prioritize that. Um, in the Bible class this morning, we kind of introduced our three lesson theme, talking about the life of Moses and seeing how Moses foreshadows Jesus in so many ways, and maybe some ways that you haven't thought of before. And so we're going to continue that. Um, this morning in the Bible class period, we talked about the birth of Moses and the early childhood of Moses, and compared that to the birth and early years of Jesus, and how they're very, very similar. Um, but there's some interesting things when you're going through uh, big sections of narrative text in the Bible, uh, time goes like this. So Moses' life runs approximately 120 years, which is a long time, um, which means I'm just getting going. That's, that's amazing. Um, but what happens in Exodus 1 and 2, Moses is born in Exodus 2, and we see Pharaoh's daughter adopt him, and by the time we get halfway through the chapter, he's 40. And so there are you know, three plus decades of his life, and we just don't have a whole lot about him. Um, you get a little bit of detail in Hebrews, and you get a little bit of detail in Acts 7, and we're going to look at those passages here in a minute. Um, but you break Moses' life down into those thirds. There's this big event when he's 40, there's this big event when he's 80, and then the conclusion of his life on Mount Nebo at 120. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to pick up in Exodus chapter 2, round about verse 11, and continue reading about that event that marked that, that turning point in his life. So Exodus chapter 2, starting about verse 11. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. Again, that's a word that's significant to Exodus. It was mentioned several times in chapter 1. He looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? And he answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, Reuel, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and even drew water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, Then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and gave, he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. And she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Like there's so much to unpack even just from that one event. And there's some significant things to look at there. What we're going to talk about is the humility of Prince Moses. And we're going to think about his flight from Egypt to Midian. You know, so the map that you're looking at there, there's several potential routes that the Exodus could have taken. The, the dashed line in red is one of the more traditional routes. I kind of favor that one myself. But one of the reasons that map is helpful is because you have these other dashed lines, and those dashed lines help us see uh, road systems and trade routes. And so the one on the bottom there that kind of goes from tip to tip between the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba um, is likely 
the route that Moses took when he fled from Egypt and ended up going into the land of Midian. And again, there are some places over there in Midian today where uh, people believe Moses stopped. There's a spring and a well uh, that people believe is the where he met his wife and delivered them from the shepherds. So that's possibly where he went. So let's back up, go back to verse 11, and kind of talk down through this a little bit and get to the point where we can make some application. Something really significant in verse 11, there was a day when Moses had grown up and he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And I want you to try to put yourself in Moses' shoes, like what would that have been like to be Moses? He knew who he was. Because of the providence of God, he'd been raised by his family in his formative years, he knew who he was. He knew he was a Hebrew. He knew who his parents were. He knew who his siblings were. He knew that he was different from everybody else. And then to go into Pharaoh's household, and then all of a sudden you have all of the privileges that go along with being in Pharaoh's household. And that's, those are privileges that the rest of your people will never get to experience. And so imagine growing up being torn between two different worlds that were at odds with each other. And that's, that's who Moses was. And as he thinks about all of that, there's something really interesting. When you go over, now put a bookmark in Exodus 2 and turn over to Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen in his sermon, as he's giving a defense for Jesus and actually comparing Moses and Jesus, one of the points that he makes in that sermon is that God is the God of his people and he's not restricted by geography. That God was with Moses when he left. God was with uh, Abraham when he left. Like God is in all of these places. He's not restricted to the temple in Jerusalem. But he's also making the point that the Israelites have always rejected their deliverers. And so he's looking at Moses. And let's start in verse 20. Acts 7 verse 20. At this time Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. There's that idea again. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and in his deeds. And so that's trying to explain, that's summarizing his early adult life. But then you get to verse 23, it says, When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. Verse 25 is significant. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And what that is revealing is it's revealing Moses' mindset, his thought process. That at 40 years old, he knew enough and he was aware enough, he felt the pain of his family. I mean, this is not right. They're being oppressed. Someone needs to do something. God is going to deliver them. And he looks at his life and he sees how providential it has been and that he's got influence with Pharaoh's household. And so he reaches the conclusion, I think God means to use me to help my people. And so when he goes out that day to, to visit his family, he's wrestling with the timing of all of that and providentially happens upon an Egyptian beating a Hebrew person. And he doesn't lose his cool. It's not a moment of passion. He knows how hard things have been, but there's a specific instance and he's like, at least I can do that. And he jumps in to intervene. And what he assumes is, that the rest of the Israelites will reach the same conclusion that he has reached. They'll recognize his providential life. They'll recognize that he might be able to do something that they can't do for themselves. He assumes that they'll reach that conclusion and that they'll reach that conclusion in this moment, this concrete moment, and they don't. And so when you read the Exodus account, it seems like just a happenstance kind of thing and kind of a fly-by-night, Moses being impulsive. But what Stephen helps us understand is that's not the way it went down. And so when you come back to Exodus chapter 2, and Moses has intervened, 
he has delivered his Hebrew brother, he goes out the next day. Same area of town. And what we know from Acts is he's, he's walking in, and if you were Moses, what kind of reception do you think you would get? I mean, imagine you're at high school, and the day before, you just defended some nerd from getting beat up by a bully, and you walk into the classroom full of nerds, what do you think you're going to get? Our hero. And that is not what he got. Instead, you had some snotty Hebrew guy sound like a lippy kid in the back seat who says, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Like, who are you to tell me what to do? You're not my mom. You're not my dad. Blah, 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 blah. And Moses is like, what? And then the guy specifically refers to the murder of the Egyptian. And then Moses gets scared. Okay, so let's, let's catch some things up here. What we see in verse 11 is that Moses initially saw his people's burdens. He, he comprehended them. He understood them. He saw the need. He's not going to intervene unless he first sees that need. But he saw it, and he understood it, and he felt it. And so he tried to do something about that. Let's, uh, let's add some more layer to it than that. Let's go over to Hebrews 11 and add a few more layers to Exodus 2. Hebrews chapter 11, this hall of faith, as so many call it, you have uh, person after person after person from the Old Testament giving us demonstrations of what it looks like to live a life of faith. Where you've heard the instruction or the promise of God, and based on what you know about God, you end up choosing to do what God has called you to do, despite the circumstances or, or the outcome. You're living a life of hope. So in verse 23, this section that begins with Moses starts with Moses' parents, as we already mentioned in Bible class. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So that's what the parents did, by faith. But then in verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused. He's making a decision. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Okay, let's, let's talk down through that for a second. Go back to verse 24. By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And there's something very specific that's implied in all of that. The day that he killed the Egyptian, he made a decision. And the decision that he made was, all of the advantages that I have had being in Pharaoh's household, I'm giving them up. All the money, all the education, the nice chariot, all the slaves, the great food, the parties, whatever... Whatever came with that station of life, I'm giving that up. You know how hard that is to give up? I mean, imagine if you were Moses. Would you give up the advantages that you have? And in your head, you're like, well, that'd be, of course I would give that up. You say that now. Wait until you've had it. And it's not being taken from you. You're choosing to give it up. He chose to give it up. When he killed that Egyptian, he made a choice to give up the worldly advantage that he had. Not only that, verse 25, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. The, this, I want to be really careful about this. I think there's, there's something implied here, but I don't want to make too much of it because I just don't know. The Egyptian way of life was full of idolatry. And that idolatry and that worldliness carried with it certain behaviors. I don't know what Moses participated in or what he did not, but it was available to him. 
It was a part of the lifestyle. Now, whether he participated or not, I would like to think he did not. It was available. And what he chose is, no, that easy life full of temptation that is so temporary and fleeting and doesn't satisfy, I'm turning my back on that too. But not only that, he's turning his back on that to take on humiliation. I'm actually getting rid of the sinful pleasures, the fleeting pleasures of sin, and I'm taking on the humiliation of belonging to slaves. I'm giving up all of the benefits to become less. I'm giving up Pharaoh's house for slaves' quarters. That was a part of his choice. That'd be really, really hard to do. I mean, think about, think about people that you try to share the gospel with that are coming out of super worldly environments that have been exposed to things that maybe you were not exposed to. If you grew up in a, in a solid Christian family and your parents tried to protect you from certain things, and as parents, that's a great goal. It's not always possible. You do the best you can, but there's some things that happen that are outside of your control. But there are some families where like Satan is invited to live in the living room. He's got a bedroom in the back door. Like horrible things happen there. You know, I know somebody that smoked through their first half pack of cigarettes by the time they were five. Now that was not me. But that was them. And they didn't get sick. Because they were so exposed to that much secondhand smoke by the time they were five. And they didn't get caught. Because there were so much cigarettes in that house, one pack going missing was no big deal. And that's just cigarettes, right? So imagine somebody who has been exposed to the, the fleeting pleasures of sin, the temporary pleasures of sin, like that is just their culture. It's expected and normal and celebrated. And then they hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they make a decision to give that up and pursue this. Moses has been exposed to all of that and chooses God's people and the humiliation that goes along with that. That's not all that he does. Let's skip down to verse 27. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king. Not being afraid of the anger of the king. Um, we need to harmonize something here. Because when you go back to Exodus chapter 2, and he realizes the thing has become known, the text specifically says he was afraid. So how is it that Exodus says Moses was afraid when that guy said, are you going to kill me like the Egyptian? But then here it says he did not let the fear of the king, he was not afraid of the anger of the king. How do you harmonize those things? And there are a couple of possibilities. One is this. In Exodus chapter 2, it specifically says that he was afraid. It doesn't specify the source of his fear. What could he have been afraid of? He could have been afraid of the loss of his life. He could have been afraid of the loss of his influence. He could have been afraid of several different things. Specifically here in Hebrews 11, it says he was not afraid of the anger of the king. So maybe, maybe to harmonize the two, he had more generalized fear in Exodus, but specifically he was never afraid of the anger of the king. It's possible. I think that's kind of clunky. I think there's another idea here. And it's one that convicts me. Back in Exodus 2, he was afraid. What's the most logical, contextual thing that he's afraid of? He's afraid of dying. He's afraid of being found out, and he's afraid of dying. But here in Hebrews 11, it says he's not afraid of the fear of the king, and he endures as seeing him who is invisible. Maybe if you put the two together, it goes something like this. Was he afraid? Yes. But at the end of the day, did his fear determine the decision? No. Was it rational to be scared? Yes. But did that fear become the deciding factor? No. You see what I'm getting at? 
And maybe to help us with that, there's a parallel uh, idea in 1 Peter. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. And can I just say for a second, I know I'm about to touch on something that culturally is uh, delicate, and I get that. And I'll just share with you, the last time that I preached this sermon, uh, there was someone visiting from the community and they walked out. As we read this passage and made this point. Okay. So, I understand that it's culturally counterintuitive. We're about to say something delicate. I get that. But it's what the Bible teaches. So let's go through it together. 1 Peter chapter 3, the first six verses, Peter is writing and instructing wives. Right? And their interaction with husbands. And that they're supposed to submit to their husbands. And this is where the lady walked out. Okay. Now, I'm not saying, and maybe I could have spent more time with this. I didn't know it was a delicate thing for that person. I'm not saying that women are supposed to be doormats to their husbands. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying that biblical headship means a husband gets to be abusive and dictatorial and a jerk. I'm not saying that. God's going to hold him accountable for that sort of thing. But what this is saying is that in the ideal, wives ought to be subject to their husbands. Specifically in a scenario where a wife is married to a husband who is not a believer, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see a respectful and pure conduct. Some of our earlier English versions in verse 2 will say when they see your respectful conduct, your pure conduct with fear. That fear has to do with respect. And in the context, I would make the case that I think the fear that they are experiencing, the respect that they are demonstrating, is toward the Lord. That these wives are doing a really hard thing by submitting to a husband because of their reverence for God and what God has said them to do. And I think we get more at that when you get to verse 6, when it's talking about Sarah obeying Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Don't fear anything that is frightening. It can be a scary thing to submit to somebody. And let's be really clear about submission. Submission is not agreement. If he meant agreement, he would say agreement. I mean, I've met some women that are like, oh, I submit all day long. I'm like, oh, I don't think you do. I think you call it submission, but it's agreement because he's doing what you want him to do. Okay. Submission is when you go along with it even when you don't agree because they are the head and you are not. And then that's when I get that moment. Submission is not agreement. If he meant agreement, he would have said agreement. And it's scary. It's scary to be in the position where you're supposed to submit. And let's say really quickly, this submission is not exclusive to the role of husband and wife. We're supposed to submit to each other. And every disciple is supposed to submit to the Lord. And when you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and it talks about headship. Even men, we are under our head Christ. And so, like, submission, I think people get the wrong idea when biblically we talk about submission. They think we're just going to rail against women all day long. We are not. So no matter what role you're in, it can be a scary thing to submit. And let's just acknowledge that. It can be scary. But let's acknowledge that, and at the end of the day, don't let that fear be the driving factor. Let your awe of God be the driving factor. And so when you come back to Moses, was it right for him to be scared? Yes. But at the end of the day, that, that earthly fear was not what determined his decision. His faith in the Lord helped him overcome that fear. Does that make sense? And so he chose humiliation, but he didn't let fear control him. I think that's reasonable to say. When you go back to Hebrews chapter 11... It says that he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured. Such a humbling thing. It was a long haul. It was a long haul. And let's, let's go back to the text for just a second. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 2. And I want, I want you to think through this. Before we look at the text, I want you to imagine your grade school days. <laughs> 
when they had you do a project, and they're like, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you're like, all the things. I want to be a police person. You know, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer. Wow, wow. And you want to be all of them. And you're thinking about your, your aspirations and your talents and your dreams, and you do that, and you do it again when you're in high school, and you're trying to figure out, you know, placing myself, what occupation do I really see myself going into? What education do I need or training do I need to hit those things? And you have dreams for your life. And you have those interviews, and they're like, where do you see yourself in five years? And you're like, well, in five years, I'm going to be, you know, whatever. I do not think that at 40, Moses' dream and aspiration was to be a fugitive rescuing seven sisters in a foreign land with their sheep. What Stephen said his aspiration was, was to lead a million plus people out of slavery. And what the text emphasizes in Exodus chapter 2, and, and it's intentionally using this language. Come down to verse 17, Exodus 2, 17. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and he saved them. You want to do a slow clap? Like, yes, he saved those seven girls. Seven foreign girls. And when they get home and their dad's like, hey, you're home really early today. What happened? And they said in verse 19, an Egyptian. He looks Egyptian. They don't say a Hebrew. He looks Egyptian. An Egyptian delivered us. I hear that and I just hear the song from the, the animated Moses movie from 20 years ago. Deliver us seven girls. Hit the peak of his career. How humbling is that? I mean, you know the education, you know everything he's done, you know what his aspirations are, and he is a vagabond. He's homeless. And the girls that he helped left him there. Their dad was like, what are you doing? Bring him home. How humbling was that? I mean, really what's going on in verses 12 through 15 is he is rejected. And that's what Stephen is honing in on in Acts chapter 7. He was willing. He thought he was capable. He thought that he had been prepared. He was ready to do it. Now he was mistaken. The would-be leader of Israel was first sent out to take care of dumb animals for 40 years. And that is nasty. We're just, we're not as agrarian as we used to be even here in the West. Certainly not as much as they were back there in the Middle East. But what those men do to care for those animals, and David had that kind of heart. David had that kind of heart. Where they see their, their animals as children. They know the personalities of those animals. And they have sleepless nights taking care of them. And they get up early to take care of them. And they're training them. And they're tending their wounds. And like it's a big deal. And at the end of the day, they have no problem when it comes time where, okay, now we're going to consume one. But they don't do it flippantly or arbitrarily. And Moses spent 40 years doing that. And he did not know that it was going to end in 40 as far as he was under the impression, it was going to go on until his life ended. Like, this is my lot. And what Exodus 2 emphasizes is he was content. Verse 21, he was content to dwell with the man. I mean, there are guys, and I'm sure Moses had these moments, but I think this, this verse summarizes those 40 years. You get to that point in your life where you're like, this is not what I signed up for, and this is not what I thought I was going to do, and I've wasted my life, and where did I go wrong? Where was the wrong turn? I wish I could go back. I wish I could hit the rewind button. And you have these, these seeds of doubt 
And I'm sure Moses had some of those, but overall, he contented himself with what he was doing. He developed contentment. So how does that relate to Jesus? Where Moses says in Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, and it is to him you shall listen. And I hope it's pretty obvious how that relates to Jesus. Listen, Jesus saw our burdens. How often did the Gospels explain that Jesus looked on them with compassion? He saw the crowds and he was moved. Jesus understood that we were under a burden that we could not remove. And he hurt for us. I mean, that's what Moses was doing when he went out and saw his people's burdens. He's like, they have something, they're carrying a load that they can't get rid of. And they need to be set free from that. Jesus saw our burdens. What about in Matthew chapter 11, where he calls those who are weak and heavy laden to come to him, and I will give you rest. And he's not talking about a 40-pound backpack on your shoulders. He's talking about something spiritual. Or Philippians chapter 2, you know, Moses rejected the worldly advantages that he had in Pharaoh's house. Jesus rejected the advantages that he had as God. That's what Paul is emphasizing over in Philippians chapter 2. And let's look at that quickly. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And I love that phrase because what that phrase describes is somebody holding something so tightly that you start to see the white popping on their knuckles, right? Like when your kid finally gets a hold of that toy that they want, right? Jesus could have hung on to the advantages that he had in heaven, but he let those go so that he could come down here. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or white-knuckled, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Verse 7, he made himself nothing. Some of the earlier English translations made it really confusing for people because it said he emptied himself. And so, for you know, years ago, there's this big debate. What did he empty himself of? Does that mean he was less than God when he became man? So he really wasn't God on the cross? Like, what percentage? How does that work? 60, 40, 70, 30? And like, you're missing the point. Jesus was God and man. Welcome to the paradox of the incarnation. He was both. You figure it out when you get to heaven and talk to God about that. Okay? It's one of the miracles. Guess what? That means it's not possible, but it happened. But what the phrase implies is that there was some kind of emptying. I think the ESV is paraphrasing when it says he made himself nothing. Uh, think about it like this. When someone is super arrogant, what do we say that they are full of? Themselves. That guy is so full of himself. What's the opposite of that? When someone is humbled, they're empty of themselves. And so when it's talking about Jesus making himself nothing, to make himself nothing, is Jesus nothing? No. But he made himself nothing. He emptied himself of himself. There was no pride. There was the opposite of pride. There was nothing but humility on the part of Jesus. And that's what this whole thing in Philippians 2 is describing. He humbled himself and humbled himself and humbled himself and humbled himself. He rejected any advantage that he had every right to claim. And then the contrast at the end of that section in Philippians 2 is God exalted him. So Jesus rejected any advantage. He also rejected temporary pleasure. All through his life, Satan was trying to get him to give in to sin. All through his life. Matthew chapter 4, you have the temptation in the wilderness where Satan is trying to get him and trying to get him. And he's appealing to his physical desires that he literally has because he's God in the flesh. But Jesus rejects those temporary pleasures. Again, he chooses humiliation, Philippians 2. Luke chapter 22 in the prayer in the garden. I think Jesus was not looking forward to the cross. You don't sweat drops of blood unless you're scared or anxious or worked up. And we could spend time talking about what exactly was he so nervous about. Like, it's just death. 
I mean, you're talking about a guy who's about to bear the sins of the world on his shoulders. He's about to become sin for us. I know that's a theologically loaded statement, but it's what the text says. He's about to be our propitiation, right? He's about to offer his pure blood. Like, let's talk about the significance of all of that and that there's more than just death going on here. He's bearing the weight of God's wrath for sin. And I think that is something that we need to talk about more when we talk about the crucifixion. And that the more we come to appreciate that, the more we'll come to appreciate the weight that he was carrying when he was praying in the garden. Did Jesus have something to be afraid of? Yes. And you see his humanity peeking through when he says, I don't want to do it. If there's any other way to pull off your redemptive plan than this, please let us do that. But there was no plan B. And so you see Jesus who's afraid, but he doesn't let his fear control him. Eventually, he humbly submits and goes on and lets Judas betray him and the, the crowd arrest him. Right? You see him endure. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Hebrew writer talks about Jesus who endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus endured. And Stephen's point in Acts chapter 7 is that just like Moses was rejected, just like these other deliverers were rejected, Jesus was rejected. Jesus was rejected by his people. And I'll just, I'll throw this out there. The verse isn't in here, but I'll throw this out here. Shortest verse in the Bible over in the Gospel of John, Jesus wept. And I appreciate that verse. And one of the reasons I appreciate that verse is I think it communicates something about the humanity of Jesus and the depth of feeling that he could feel and that crying is okay. Like, we shouldn't need that. But Jesus wept. The question is, why did he weep? And there are people that read down through the context and the, the conclusion that they reach, and I don't think it's inherently wrong, is he's weeping over the loss of Lazarus. I think there's more to it than that. I think textually that what the text in John is driving at, especially in the paragraph surrounding that statement, is the disbelief that the people closest to him had about his power and his ability to intervene. They don't realize who he is. And he's been trying to tell them for years who he is. And they still don't get it. And so he's in the midst of these people who are hurting and mourning worse than they need to because they don't realize who's with them. And so he mourns and weeps and cries, not for Lazarus, but for the people that are there because they don't get it. They'll come to get it. And again, I think the text points that out in several different ways. But it's just a little subtle way that they just didn't get it. Jesus was rejected. So what lessons can we take? from Moses and Jesus. The first is this. Moses wanted to serve so badly, Jesus was willing to serve. But if you're going to serve the Lord, it's going to begin with humbling yourself. And your service might not look like what you think it ought to look like. We all have these grand ideas. I'm going to serve in this big, glorious way. Well, you may, you may not. Let's just get about meeting the needs that are there that we see. You know, this is usually one of those times when I get up and say, the Lord needs less professional pulpiteers. We need less young men that are like, oh, I'm going to preach for the Lord and for a church of 400 and blah, blah, blah. Okay, I guess somebody's got to do that, but you don't have to aspire to that. Just go out and start teaching people the gospel and let the Lord take care of the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Okay? Don't aspire to that. Just go help people with the gospel. Serving the Lord always begins with humility. And your faith in God needs to be greater than the fear of man. And your fear of man is going to be normal and natural. Yet you're going to experience these natural things. You don't have to feel ashamed when you feel that fear. Moses felt that initial fear. Jesus felt that initial fear. So did Joseph, for that matter. I mean, the guy almost died by the hands of his brothers. And being human trafficked wasn't much better. But whatever it is that you may be fearing, let your faith in God overcome that. 
and simply do what God wants you to do and be what God wants you to be. And mistreatment with God's people is better than the temporary pleasures of sin. Choosing to be on the Lord's side here, even though people are going to look at you and be like, that is weird. Or you're actually signing up for people to look down on you, that's okay. It's better to be with God's people than to be enjoying temporary things that make your life easy right now. Okay? Another way to say that is that suffering with Jesus is better than earthly treasure. We didn't say a whole lot about that phrase in Hebrews chapter 11. Because it says that, that Moses chose to suffer with Christ. It's like, wow, he didn't even know about Jesus. How did that happen? When, when God's people choose to suffer for God, they're suffering for Christ. And he did that. The other thing that the Hebrew writer said is that he focused on the one who is unseen. We need to focus on the eternal and the one who's invisible. And that is not going to make sense to people of the world. Actually, you choosing to live a life of faith proves that those things are there. That's what the Hebrew writer says earlier in chapter 11. So I hope this was helpful. I hope looking at Moses and his period of humbling and what God did to really shape him for working with God's people, which should humble God's people. God got his leaders ready to lead people by getting them around dumb, nasty, smelly animals, which should humble God's people. We're not the greatest. It's actually why we need Jesus. So let's humble ourselves and be ready to do that. If there's anyone here this morning that needs to become a Christian that recognizes that Jesus was the fulfillment of Moses' prophecy, that he was the greater deliverer, he was the one that could do what Moses could not. If you'd like to become a Christian this morning, you can do that. Maybe you're already a disciple and we're trying to figure out how to better serve in the kingdom. I hope these principles are helpful to you. They were convicting to me as I studied through them. And if there's anybody that needs prayers of encouragement or needs to respond to this morning's lesson in any way, Come to the front while we stand and while we, while we sing.